I believe we have uh, John Hogan clicking in now. Oh, look at that beautiful background he chose. Hey, John, <laughs> how, <laughs> how is it going, sir? It's going pretty well. How are you doing, Tim? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Um, tell us, I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm, ju I'm just going to give you a nice softball pitch underhand right off, right, right off the bat. Everyone tell, tell everyone a little bit about yourself, and uh, um, we'll just, we'll just kind of start there. Okay. Um, it's always a hard, hard trying to find out, trying to figure out where to, <laughs> where, where to pinpoint it. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, um, I am right off the bat, I'll tell you, I'm an FSHD patient. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how I got involved with the society here. And um, worked at IBM for about 25 years in various technical leadership positions. And the last thing I did at IBM before I left and started my own company uh, was AI. So AI research and uh, artificial intelligence implementations, you know, in the corporate world, Fortune 500 stuff. And, um, and I think <clears throat> when I became a patient, I was like, wow, you know, one of the first things I did was join the registry, the FSHD, you know, the registry that's at the University of Rochester. And I'm like, well, this is an absolute treasure trove of information for AI. So AI likes a lot of data. Um, and in our case, it likes, it just would like a lot of data on patients. You know, what are the patient's demographics? You know, how old are they? What's their gender? Um, <clears throat> how long have they had the disease? How severe is the disease? Uh, what kind of symptoms, the initial symptoms, secondary symptoms, you know, what kind of uh, medications and supplements are they taking? Um, all of that is recorded in this registry. And it was, just, you know, it was just a phenomenal, you know, light bulb went off in my head. And this could be a great project to apply what they call machine learning. And it's a type of AI. It's like this, you know, I call it like the simplest type of AI. It's statistics based. It's not the Terminator. You know, it's not an independent <laughs> entity, you know, going out there, you know, with machine guns and, you know, fighting and, and you know, winning against humans, you know, smarter than human type of thing. It's statistics. And, but the cool thing about machine learning is that <clears throat> you're not just applying like one type of statistic, you know, to try to figure out patterns in the data. Uh, you're applying, you're letting the machine loose. You're letting the computer go loose on the data and sort of find a pattern, you know, find a reason for a business, you know, for a, a scientific problem. Hmm. And um, <clears throat> so I sort of came up with this, this concept, um, you know, in the back of a napkin one day and, you know, I called up June. Um, hmm. And June's like, yeah, this sounds good. Let me, you know, let me hook you up with, uh, you know, Jeff Statlin and, you know, Robbie Tweel, you know, a couple of our awesome scientists on our team here we're lucky to have. Yeah. And see if they would, you know, entertain doing this type of analysis. And um, they said yes. And so what I've been doing for the past couple of years here with the society is going, going through this data. And, you know, we started this project got a little bit of funding. We didn't need that much funding. And see, that's the thing, the data's there. So we didn't have to go out and capture the data, you know, or go out and ask, you know, patients for more data, it was there. So all we really had to do is write an AI routine. And there's a bunch of technical stuff there. If anybody's interested, then please just, you know, contact me with, with questions about, you know, how we did this. But you know, we came up with a, uh, a few types of algorithms, set them loose, and found some interesting patterns uh, mm. in, this, in this data. Okay. Well, now you got my curiosity, I'm <laughs> sure. Uh, it was getting peaked as you were talking. I was like, this is good. You really had me a Terminator, by the way, but yeah, uh, yeah. that's good. <laughs> so what are some of the things that you've discovered using AI with the information that you kind of plugged into it? So this is all preliminary. So, and you know, I can tell you what we found, what the models found. Okay. And you know, it's up to the you know the scientific teams to to sort of interpret these results. Sure. Um. So one of the more interesting things was you know we're trying to predict. It's it's a variable disease, right? Like I have it. I wasn't diagnosed until 50, 50, 
three or something like that. Okay. Um, and I'm not in a wheelchair. You know, mm -hmm. I'm perfectly fine. And you know, yesterday I dead deadlifted 300 pounds um, <laughs> at the gym. So, but my cousin uh, is in a wheelchair. He was in the wheelchair, you know, in his 40s. My other cousin was discharged from the Coast Guard at age 24, right? Wow. So, you know, there, you know, everybody on this call knows the, the variability of the disease. Mm -hmm. uh, what, is there something in that data that could possibly indicate that variability? And so the algorithms we had were trying to predict, okay, who's going to be in a wheelchair or who is, who is in a wheelchair? You know, just by looking at the data and not knowing if the person is in a wheelchair, who, you know, could the algorithm sort of tell? And in fact, it could tell. Whoa. And it's relying on a lot of age. So if you're in a wheelchair, it's correlated to, highly correlated to anything in your age. The older you are, the more likely you're in a wheelchair. Okay, well, that's obvious. Um, starts getting a little more interesting in that the duration was actually more important to the model we built than the person's like just raw age, right? And the duration is defined as uh, when were you diagnosed to your current age? So whatever that was. For me, it's, you know, three years. <laughs> so for other people, you know, it could be much longer. And so it's a short duration. And so the model's correctly predicting me that plus a bunch of other factors I'll get into, but that, okay, I'm not in a wheelchair. Um, but age, so the older you are, Mm -hmm. uh, duration, okay. uh, some of the, the number of medications people were taking, not, not the actual medications, but the number of medications was an important indicator. And okay, so you might say, well, that's, you know, if you're taking a lot of indications, chances are you're in a weaker state and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you just, you know, you're in a weaker state and okay, yes, it makes sense that, you know, you might be in a wheelchair. Sure. So that's, um, um, and I think it's, you know, when you look at these models, it's, it's sort of a cumulative. Okay, so you have a higher duration, plus you're a little bit older, plus you're on a, a lot of meds. Okay, the model's probably gonna say that you're, on, that you're you know, headed to a wheelchair. Um, <clears throat> again, there's a lot of variability. So the model's not perfect, you know, but it was, it was highly predictive. You know, it was above uh, 80, 89%, I think, in, in one of the indicators. Wow. So, now, yep. What kind, of, what kind of feedback, since you've, you've, you, you kind of alluded to the fact that you're collecting the data for the researchers, the doctors uh, um, that can use the data and then interpret it, what kind of feedback have you received, if any, from them on what you've been able to do in helping in their research with this data? So it's interesting enough that and we should probably do a follow-up study. And the follow-up study is, uh, needs, we need more data. So we had about uh, 590 patients out of the US registry. Okay. What we want to do is verify these findings in another registry. And so we might go grab uh, a similar registry in, in the UK and another one in France. And we'll try to combine up all this data <laughs> and again, run these, run these models. This was a quick project. So this is one type of models that we use called supervised machine learning. At some other point, we might want to use something called unsupervised machine learning, which is with supervised, you have to sort of help it. You have to label the data. So you have to say, okay, this is a patient. Here's their age. With unsupervised, you just kind of give it all the data and it, you know, it magically finds these patterns. So more sophisticated models, more data, if we verify the U.S. results, then it can be used for many things, including, you know, helping individuals um, in, when they come into the clinic, um, sort of understand the disease. Uh, also helping research uh, understand factors in, in variability and, you know, sort of pinning down uh, what's causing the variability. And, and if you notice, Tim, I didn't talk about genetics quite yet. <laughs> um, that's, that's an important topic we can come back to, but um, and so I think at this point, AI loves more data. If we can grab several hundred similar registry records from France and, you know, a whole bunch more from the UK and, and put them all together in sort of one big registry and then maybe add in clinical trial data, the similar data is collected when anytime anybody has a trial and throw that in and into the mixer and, 
and see what comes out. That's fascinating. What What about you were talking about the um, kind of tease it there about the gene therapies and, and how this relates that are, what's kind of the tie-in if there's one? Well, okay, so I went into this study thinking the AI is going to find a great correlation with sort of the genetics and yeah. the severity of the disease. Okay. And in fact, there is a correlation, but it's weaker. It's weaker than sort of this demographic data, you know, around age and duration and you know, number of meds and actually gender is a pretty good indicator too. Um, but it's there. So it's in there. It's in the mix, but it's less of an indicator. It doesn't mean there's, it's not an indicator, um, but it's less of, you know, the way we, we um, you know, entered the study. And so I think um, this is another good reason to uh, do some unsupervised learning and see if there's something else or something else that's not labeled in the data that's present in the data but you know we as humans you know can't fully understand the patterns of the correlations there's actually a doctor uh, in the UK Chris Banerjee's who's done some of this unsupervised learning and he's he has found that it can predict you know the, the sort of the phenotypes of the disease sort of the classifications of people in the disease and um, and I think that's something else that we need to we need to go and validate or re uh, revalidate in these reg you know massive registries uh, of data. So if we can do like the unsupervised and um, you know validate Chris Banerjee's uh, findings as well, I think we can sort of you know elicit out more of the genetic information about what's going on. Yeah. As you kind of like let the computer um, just let loose, like you were saying, and just kind of find the. Uh, Man, the common things, I guess, like my primitive brain is trying to wrap around what would be the proper terminology there, but it's almost like trying to find the things that are common or this yeah. seems to stand out, rise to the top, so to speak, of this is interesting facts. Um, has it, might, there, it might be two things yeah. together. So it might be a, you know, a combination of a feature, mm -hmm. one with feature two, with feature three. So it might be an initial symptom. Mm -hmm. So like if your initial symptom was facial weakness yeah. and you have something else and then century changes, I don't know, you know I'm just making things up. Uh, if you have three or a combination of four of these things, you could start to see that that might be a really good indicator uh, of this particular, you know, of, of, of the severity of the disease, All right? And so, and that's, you know, the machine, the computers are great sort of teasing out these, you know, co, you know, these um, uh, features that are co-varying or, you know, it could be uh, another type of correlation. It's really good at, you know, seeing four or five, six things uh, together. Yeah. And then as we sort of, so we sort of have these registries with, um, you know, the, you know, 100 things they're collecting about patients. Well, what if we start to add, you know, we go out and we study, you know, prospectively, um, what the patients are like, you know, what's, what are their features, you know, beyond, you know, what we sort of standardly collect, let's, let's go out and get some more uh, data, you know, it could be anything, it could be something environmental or epigenetic that we're not collecting now, but, you know, we sort of have to figure out what is that perfect expanded data set that we can go grab and, you know, set the machine loose. I feel like this then could possibly be something that you can use um, to identify uh, the severity of FSHD, let's say even in a younger person, I'm a parent. Yeah. So having a tool where if your data was collected and you have some type of more percentage of, oh, your child had, you know, like you said, a uh, facial weakness or a couple factors, that here's where then it could go because this data shows that consistently it falls in these lines. I mean, could this be a tool to help kind of find early onset and then help describe what could very well or forecast a little bit what someone could be in for? Yeah, no, AI is good at predicting and forecasting. And so conceivably, yes, but I'll, you know, have to leave it to the medical teams to figure that out. But, you know, and I'm sort of here to support what the medical teams are doing. Um, you know, so the medical teams, scientific teams, research has to define the problem. You know, we have to work together because 
you know, our team has to say, well, AI is good at, you know, researching a certain type of problem. Maybe it's prediction of wheelchair use or, you know, maybe it's prediction of early, you know, earlier onset or whatever. Um, so we have to say, okay, yeah, yeah, it is going to be good for that. And um, so they have to give us the problems. We have to say, yes, that's, that's a really good thing. Or no, you know, AI is not good for, you know, what you, what you want it for. Yeah. So I think that's, you know, that's sort of the next step is, you know, we need to get m these more sophisticated models uh, of uh, working on more sophisticated uh, uh, scientific problems against, yes, retrospective data and the stuff that's in the registry and prospective data, stuff that we get, you know, new things that we go gather. And I think this is a theory is, all right, well, the models can sort of um, point us in the right direction, get a signal, and then we go out and say, well, if we have this extra bit of information that's gonna increase the accuracy, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40%, and actually, you know, get us to a, a high, highly accurate model that could then be used in a, in a clinical setting. Wow. Now, a day like today, Giving Tuesday, you know, we're asking those to donate. We have a big match of uh, funds in the hopper there that, you know, up now to $150 or $150,000 matching. Um, from your perspective of having FSHD, you mentioned your cousins that have it as well. Um, what, what does a day like this mean to you from a patient side? Yeah. I mean, we have, we have to keep trying, man. We have to keep... Uh, applying the research dollars and you know to these problems and not every problem is is going to be solved on you know the first shot so you have to keep at it and you know have another project another project another project adding more people um <clears throat> and we have to do it i mean if if we're not going to do it then nobody's going to do it and i think this is you know this kind of thing that you're doing today is just phenomenal and you know the information you know this the information that's that's communicated on these sessions here is is just incredible and you know we have to keep raising awareness and yeah and uh keep formulating these projects yet the fshd society is is awesome at that i i can't be more impressed with this society uh at you know the way that they're they're supporting research and allocating money to awesome projects uh and awesome teams you know everywhere so yeah, I mean, we have to, we, you know, we have kids. I personally have five kids and oh, you know, yeah. we, we need to have resolution to this. Absolutely. And, you, know, you know, and it's just, and I'll say that, yes, sort of on a personal level, but, you know, in general, the more we discover about this disease, the more we know in general about the human body, right? In this, I'm a layman, you know, I, I'm a techie, so, but, you know, just common sense is all right well if we can understand how muscles are reacting to duct spore and how the alleles are you know um deregulating you know to create this this thing that's blowing up our muscle cells well that's going to fundamentally add to our our general knowledge and so you know can we transfer whatever we're learning about fshd to other muscular dystrophies absolutely you know and other diseases in general absolutely and so, yeah, we got our, you know, we got our sort of selfish thing going on, but, you know, we're contributing uh, to yeah. everybody else, right? And let me just say one more thing, Tim. So the pattern that we're um, applying, so the, the type of research and the process of this AI research on, this, on our registry, we can absolutely transfer to anybody else who has the similar type of, you know, retrospective data gathering on their patients, right? And this is one of the first. I think there was a similar project, a project in Huntington's uh, to look at registries, but I don't think anybody else in the muscular dystrophy world um, is yet. Mm. So I think what we're learning here, and, and by the way, we learned from Huntington's and applied it here, you know, we're going to transfer to the next one into the next one to create this sort of pattern of, all right, here's how you use AI to look yeah. at patient data. Wow. And so, yeah, no, I'm glad. Thank you for doing this. And, you know, thank you. Absolutely. God. Yeah, I'm so glad that you could join us. Uh, real quick before we let you go, is there, uh, I wanted you to kind of maybe plug your company's uh, website a little bit. Where can people find out more in case you pique their interest to kind of take it to the next step? It's uh, aibytes.ai. And um, I'm on, I have a website and LinkedIn. 
I'm a small company, so we're just a few people. Um, but certainly happy to answer any questions about this study um, and you know any sort of other ideas people might have for applying AI to, to patient data of this type. Absolutely. Awesome. Thanks, John, for, for being here today and all the great work you're doing. Uh, it's powerful stuff. Uh, blowing, blowing my mind, man, using, using machines to help us. I totally appreciate what, what, what you're doing for our community. Absolutely. Thank you, Tim. Thanks for having me.